We're going to be in Luke chapter 3 today, picking up where we uh, left off. If you are visiting today, we started at the beginning of this year going through the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be moving through that uh, throughout the year. And so far, we've made it to the last half of chapter 3. Um, with that, I'm going to read this, and then we'll talk about it. Luke 3, starting at verse 21, we're at a place where John the Baptist has been out in the wilderness. He has been baptizing people um, along the Jordan River. And in verse 21, we read, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased." Uh, just a few quick comments on that. Uh, just an incredible scene, and uh, I think we probably have heard it. We, we know this well, but just amazing. Um, you know, this chapter starts out, and Luke is talking about a voice of one who is in the wilderness, and now when we get halfway through the chapter, we get to hear another voice, and that voice is from God himself. The heavens open up, as Jesus is being baptized, and, and you get this beautiful picture of the Trinity right there, um, God the Father speaking as he is doing that, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming and just fluttering over Jesus, um, and, and God says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That sounds amazing to us, even more amazing to the educated Jewish people that were there at the time, because that is two different messianic prophecies put together. One is from Psalm, Psalm chapter 2, and the other is from the prophet Isaiah. He's taking, as God speaks, he has spoken these words before through his prophets, and now he's taking these two messianic prayers, these two messianic prophecies, which means this, the people had been praying for the Messiah to come. They'd been saying, Lord, send us a new king, one that is anointed by you. Send us a savior. And as Jesus is baptized in water, he comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit is present. The, 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 the heavens are parted. There is that voice, and it is two prophecies that they had been praying and hoping for. This is my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Just two short verses that Luke addresses this, and then he goes on. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph. Now, bear with me here, if you will, bear with me. The son of Heli, the son of Methet, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Negai, the son of Math, I don't know how to say that, um, the son of Matthias, the son of Shemin, the son of Joshek, the son of Joda, the son of Jonan, the son of Rissa, the son of, I like this one, Zerubbabel, I've been trying for years now to get one of my grandsons named that. Uh, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Nuri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kossum, the son of uh, Elm Adam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, uh, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elkiam, the son of Meleah, the son of Manon, uh, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashan, the son of Amenadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sireg, uh, the son of Reu, uh, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, 
uh, the son of Arphak, Ar- Ar- Arphaxad. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you try it. Uh, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, uh, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Yeah, no, that was awful. <laughs> All right, don't, don't clap at that. Um, wow, what is going on? What is going on? When we get to next week, we're going to get to another story at the beginning of chapter 4, which is the temptation of Jesus Christ. And there's a couple things going on here. Luke, more than any other gospel writer, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke, more than any other writer, as he writes the account of Jesus' life and his ministry, he is trying to bring out the very human side of Jesus, very human side of Jesus. And put all together right here, uh, we have, one, the baptism of Jesus, very human thing to be doing. Why, why, is, why is the Son of God needing to be baptized? And, and even what we find from other Gospels is at this time, John the Baptist is trying to say, no, 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 I, I, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. This is kind of backwards here. But Jesus is baptized. He says he has to do it to complete all righteousness. Then we have this genealogy. And, uh, you know, you look at it, I'm not going to preach a a whole sermon on that genealogy. Why? Because it would be boring. It would be boring. And I've listened to some people do that, but quite frankly, you're usually pulling at straws, trying to get stuff and make this passage like, ooh, when it's not that, ooh, it is very real and very practical. How many of you have ever been to a family reunion where they decide to sit down and and tell you the family tree? And they don't just go back to your parents and your grandparents, but they go great-grandparents, great-grandparents, and go keep going back. And it's only a few people, nerds, who are actually interested in what's going on. The rest of you are like, let's just get to the next event, right? Um, I, I, that's, that's what this is. This is very basic. And in a lot of ways, what's happening here is Luke is trying to say, look, Jesus is the Son of God, He is 100% God, and yet at the same time, he is 100% man. He's not 50-50, he's 100 and 100. How does that happen? Well, it's because there is something completely different and something completely divine about him. Matthew also has a genealogy, and I've preached whole sermons off of that genealogy. It's a shorter version of this, and it goes through uh, Mary's line, and it goes all the way back just to Abraham. And what Matthew is doing is showing that Jesus Christ is from the line of David, and therefore, he is the king of the Jewish people. That's what Matthew's doing. Luke's doing something entirely different here. He goes past King David. He goes to Abraham, and he moves past Abraham. And who does he go all the way back to? He goes all the way back to Adam, and then it ends with this statement, the Son of God. What does that mean? Well, there's two thoughts. It could mean that uh, Luke is actually going back and and saying, yeah, and and Jesus is the Son of God. But equally, it could be that what he's saying is Adam is the Son of God, and he's not the Son of God in the same way that Jesus Christ is. Think about this. Who was Adam's dad? He didn't have one, right? He was created by God, created from the, the soil. The, uh, Adam, the Adam was made from the Adam. They're, they're, it's a play on words there, the word for dirt, for clay in Hebrew. Uh, that's, that's him. He is made from the clay. He is made from the dirt. And God breathes into him the breath of life to make him a person. And theologically, in the New Testament, we see it a lot in Romans, but we also see it other places, the writers of the New Testament are saying, there was one who was created from God and all of us come from, he is Adam. 
but Adam sinned. But now there is a new Adam, a new and better Adam, who wasn't just created from God, he is actually God himself, and he is sinless. If you read Romans, that's one of the main points that Paul makes in there. And Romans is like Paul's magnum opus. It's like a beautiful dissertation. Uh, It it is actually a legal document. He's using legal terms of the time, like a lawyer going before a judge and giving the case for why Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is anointed, is the Son of God, is God Himself, and has paid for our sins on the cross. It's absolutely beautiful as Paul does this. And you see it with Luke. He's going to put Jesus in very real, human, practical terms and situations, but also constantly show us by making statements like the Son of God, or as we read about the baptism, you are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Absolutely beautiful and absolutely wondrous. This, this whole baptism thing that happens here is pretty incredible. The fact that Jesus went and was baptized. Jesus went and was baptized. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about baptism today. Because I think it's important that we don't just take two verses, but that we pull it apart a little bit more. On the way to church this morning, I I was doing my normal routine. I I always wake up, and while I'm uh, eating a morning bagel and drinking coffee, I listen to a sermon. And and then when that sermon's done, I start listening to worship music. And uh, then I get in the car, and I plug my phone in, and all the way here, I have such a long drive, all the way here, I, I listen to worship music. And today I found myself as I'm driving, I'm, I'm driving and I'm praying and I'm thinking about the message and I'm thinking about some of you. And, uh, and, and while I'm driving, I, I'm like, man, the music is so quiet. I keep grabbing my volume knob and I keep turning it up, right? And I'm like, man, it's just in the back of my mind, I'm like, I got to turn my music up. It's so quiet. I can't hear it. And after a while, I'm like, why isn't my volume knob working? Well, what I discovered is I never plugged my phone in. It was in my back pocket. I was sitting on it, right? So it's like, it's, it's, it's like muffled. There's quite a bit of cushion there, and, uh, and it's in my back pocket, and the sound is muffled, but I'm just going through the motions, sort of just trying to turn up the volume, not really registering what's going on. So we get to a passage like we just studied, two verses about baptism and a genealogy. And if you've been around church for that long, or even if you're here and have never heard this before, it's easy just to check out and not really pay attention to what's going on. But here's what I'm hoping. that Today, we can wake up a little bit and, and, and digest this a little bit more, go a little bit deeper with it. When I was uh, working on my uh, master's degree, I, I took a class that looked like it was going to be easy. And I know some of you are like, really, you were paying for that. Why would you go for the easy classes instead of the classes that would stretch you? Because I'm smart, okay? (laughs) Um, Because that's the wise thing to do. Go for the easy grade when you're paying for it. Um, Here's the thing. I I took this class on the literature of C.S. Lewis, and I had read Chronicles of Narnia multiple times. I saw the movies multiple times. The professor I had, she was the most eccentric professor I have ever had in my life. She wasn't a professor of theology, she was a professor of literature, but her expertise was in C.S. Lewis, the writings of C.S. Lewis. And I thought, this is going to be an easy grade. I've read the Chronicles of Narnia so many times. Whoa! When I got into that class and we dug into those writings, I saw layer upon layer upon layer that I had never seen before. And not just in those writings, but all of Lewis's writings. There's subtlety and nuance and allegories all throughout all of his writings and depth that is more than just right there at the surface. And when we look at something like baptism, there is so much more than what we typically think of, of just, all right, uh, I'm going to sign up and now let's just push you under the water and get you back up. 
And let's be honest, we think of it that way a lot of times. So I've been having this conversation with myself about baptism, and I, there's like four questions I've been asking myself. The first is, why do we do it? Why do we do it? Why do, why, why, why do we even bother doing it? I mean, we have three people right now that want to get baptized. Why? Why do we even do it? The second is, what does it mean? What does it actually mean? The third is, who is it for? And the fourth is, how do we do it? So if you're taking notes, none of this is going to be up on the screen because, um, as I said, I'm having a personal conversation with myself. That conversation on this started late last night and went into this morning, and I rewrote all of this, okay? Um, So I'm going to just have a conversation with myself, and you get to look in on it. Uh, Neurotic Tim up here. But um, that's what's going to go on. So those four questions, once again, if you're taking notes, why do we do it? What does it mean? Who is it for? And how do we do it? First, why do we do it? Well, look at Matthew chapter 28, if you would. Again, not up on the screen. If you have a Bible with you, awesome. Awesome. If you don't have a Bible with you, you have a smartphone most likely, pull it up on there. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 16, I'll start there. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end, always to the end of the age. So he gives them three this, the, the very important things. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. So part of our job, make disciples, okay, the other end of it, teaching people to observe everything that he has commanded. Guess what? He just commanded them something. He just gave them a commandment, three things, right? And so it's kind of ironic that his third thing is to do the things that he just said. And the second one is to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why do we do it? Jesus told us to, right? I love, I love answers like that. I mean, that's like third grade Sunday school right there, right? Why do we get baptized? Jesus told us to. Yeah. And it's also what we see throughout the New Testament. You go to the book of Acts, starting on the day of Pentecost, when the church started, Peter is preaching to the crowds in Jerusalem. They are cut to the heart by their sin. And they look at Peter and they say, what do we need to do? And Peter's answer in Acts chapter 2 is this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This gift is for you and for your children and all who are far off. Wow. Peter is reemphasizing this, that when we are coming to Jesus Christ, the next step is to get baptized. And when you look through the book of Acts, you go from beginning to end, you see that happening in story after story after story. One of my favorites is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, where Philip is there, and, and, and the Ethiopian eunuch is on his chariot. Uh, he is a, a royal official, and uh, you know the Holy Spirit guides Philip to him. He's reading from a scroll, and it's a scroll written by Isaiah the prophet. And Philip is like, "Mm, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch's like, no, I don't get what it says. So Philip shares with him and presents the gospel. And the Ethiopian eunuch, right then and there, hears the good news of Jesus Christ and is like, what's to stop me from getting baptized too? There's a puddle. They're in the desert along the road. He's like, there's a puddle. Can you put me in that 
puddle and baptize me. And they did. That's amazing. That is the type of story you see. So why do we get baptized? Because our Lord and Savior commanded us to. He commanded us to. And I do think that that is important because in a lot of churches today and in our church culture, there's two things that I see a lot of times. And it, one is sort of a take it or leave it. A take it or leave it. Eh, maybe I'll do it sometime. I've been to churches before where they will have baptistries that don't work and no one's been baptized in years. There was one church I visited once that was doing some baptisms, and I asked the question, and they were excited because they said, well, we fixed the baptistry. And I started asking, like, oh, when was the last time somebody was baptized here at this church? And no one could remember. Like, no one could remember. That's either a dead church or a disobedient church. All right? It's, it's one of the two, or maybe a combination of both. But that's what we are called to do. Brothers and sisters, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, please understand, this is actually an act of obedience. In the Gospel of John, twice, Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. The other thing I see sometimes is this, stubbornness. Every once in a while, I talk to somebody that'll say, well, you know what? I was told I needed to be baptized, but I don't need to be baptized because my salvation is by faith through grace. Can I just say this? That's just being plain old stubborn. You, you can't tell me that Paul is the person, he wrote that we are saved uh, by faith through grace, right? He's the one who wrote that, but Paul's also the person running around baptizing people. He didn't write that statement to say, uh, and if anybody ever looks at you and says you need to be baptized, dig in your heels and say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And if you're hearing me right now say that and you're feeling a defiance well up, that's about you, not with what I'm saying. That's about you. That is literally you in the moment resisting the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Brother or sister, if that's you right now, humble yourself. Search it out yourself. I'll sit down with you, and we can go through this. But please don't ever be stubborn with the commands of God to say, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. You know, there was a man who was doing that in the Bible. His name was Saul of Tarsus, and he became Paul the Apostle. And when you read Acts, God actually said to Paul, it's hard to kick against the goads, isn't it? And what that means is that God, in that illustration, was the one with a cattle prod, and he was prodding Saul of Tarsus the direction he wanted him to go to the point where he had to knock Saul off a donkey and blind him to get his attention, right? In that moment, the donkey was smarter than Paul, all right? So why do we do it? Jesus commands us to do it. Second question, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, again, if you have your Bible, flip over to Romans chapter 6 with me. Again, this is Paul's, like, just his masterpiece as he writes Romans. And just this small passage in here, he says this, and he's going to explain what it means, what baptism means. Verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we had been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
What is Paul saying? Jesus Christ died. He was buried. And what happened? He raised to new life. New life. There was something completely different about his body. There was something different about the way he operated. And I mean, that's just literally. At one time, he's walking from Nazareth to Jerusalem. He's walking from the Galilee to Jerusalem. After he's resurrected, what's happening? Boop. Boop. You're like, what does that mean? He was like just appearing places, like, like wherever Jesus needed to be. All of a sudden, boop. He's just there. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's something different is going on. He's raised to new life, and there's something different that is happening now. And Paul is saying, for those of us who have been baptized, we have died to our own life, being buried. Luckily, not in dirt, okay? We don't do it that way. We don't dig a hole, bury you in dirt. We use water, right? Buried in water, and it's symbolizing the death of Jesus Christ being raised up then to new life. It's new. It's different. It's not the same. The old is gone. The new has come. And he says it's the same thing with us. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the death of Christ, that death that paid for all the sins of all time of all mankind. And by faith being raised up to brand new life. And that's what Paul's saying to the people here. As believers who have been baptized, it's not us living the same old life. We have been united with Christ. Our sins paid for by that death. And when you look at somebody who by faith has confessed to the Lord and been baptized, you are looking somebody who is brand new. Brand new. Um, forgive me for this. I used this illustration years ago, and afterwards, Cam was like, oh, don't use that illustration. I have to, okay? It's just good. Um, our house has had a lot of wear and tear over the years. And our living room carpet had a lot of wear and tear when we used to do small group at our house. All kinds of coffee stains. Thank you. All kinds of tea stains. Thank you. Um, you know, our couches, a lot of wear and tear by uh, people sitting on them and people being like, uh, you know what, I was just working in the yard all day, but it's time for small group, I'm going to get there. And you sat on my uh, couch with uh, dirty buns and grass stains. Thank you. Um, it, it's been a lot of wear and tear in a good way, okay? I'm being sarcastic here, but no, in a good way. I shampoo our carpet a lot. I shampoo it, and I shampoo it. It's like my thing uh, before holidays, birthday parties, although we're getting wise and starting to figure out maybe we should shampoo it after the birthday parties, not before. Um, you know, and, and the, the thing that drives me crazy is I have this carpet that needs to be replaced, and we haven't replaced it, sorry, and, uh, and all these stains pop up. And there's stains that have happened over the years of us being there, and I shampoo them, and I cleanse them, but guess what? it comes back. There are stains I can remember, and I, I look at them like, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> I have cleaned you so many times. I have struggled with you. I have shampooed you. I've tried multiple shampoos and multiple shampoos, and you just come back. It's not working to just clean the same old carpet. You know what I really need to do that would really help my marriage? To get a new carpet. A brand new carpet. And that's the thing. It doesn't work for us just to look at the sin in our life and just try to cover it up and try to clean ourselves. The sins just keep coming back. What do we need? We need to be new, brand new. And that's what baptism means. That by faith, through grace, we have been buried with Christ our sins paid for by his blood. 
and raised to a brand new life. And that can be ours. If you are a believer, that is yours. Third question, who is it for? Who is it for? All right, another passage. Flip with me over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus is talking with Nicodemus. He is a Pharisee. He is on the ruling council for the Jewish leaders. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Time out. Stop. What's Jesus saying here? Normally, when we think of baptism, we think of it in these terms. Either personally, I am screwed up, messed up, I've made a mess of my life, or we look at somebody else and we say, they're screwed up, they're messed up, they've made a mess of their life, therefore, they need to come to church, I'm going to tell Tim, I'm bringing a guest, please give some type of gospel sermon, I want them to accept Christ and get baptized. That's the way we think of these things, right? Somebody is so screwed up, messed up, destroyed their life, blow up, that's the person that needs to get baptized. Only, as Jesus is saying, we must be born again, who is he talking to? Nicodemus. He is a Pharisee on the ruling council and a teacher of the law. He is, in our context, a fundamentalist, conservative Christian pastor who writes great articles for the Gospel Coalition and Christianity Today and has an awesome podcast. <laughs> That's who he is. That's who he is. He has it all together. He understands, supposedly, the Word of God, and yet Jesus is like, you're the teacher. How do you not get this stuff? You're only looking at things through the eyes of an earthly man. You're not looking at things the way the Holy Spirit is moving He's a guy who has beat his body into submission. I guarantee he doesn't drink, he doesn't chew, and he doesn't date girls that do. I guarantee, like, uh, you know, the things he reads are definitely the G, probably not even the PG, and no way the 13, right? This guy is just the, the person that people look up to. Let me say it again. Fundamentalist, conservative, Christian pastor who has a podcast, writes books, and is on the speaking circuit. And yet, Jesus looks at him and is saying, none of that matters. Because, Nicodemus, it is not about your 
righteousness. You're a sinner. You need to be born again. Ooh, actually, he doesn't say you need to be born again. What does he say? You must. You must be born again. It's the only way. And it's confusing to Nicodemus. It doesn't make sense completely. And he's trying to digest this. And Jesus gives this illustration from uh, the book of Numbers. I think it's Numbers 21. Might be 12 or 21, one of the two. Um, and it's a story where uh, the, the, the children of Israel are complaining. They're rebelling against God. God brings poisonous snakes, fiery snakes. And they start getting bit. And they're uh, you know, getting poisoned. People are dying. They're crying out for salvation. Moses goes to God and says, what should we do? And God says, I want you to make a bronze statue of a snake, stick it on a pole, put it in the middle of the camp, and whenever anybody gets bit by a snake and is about to die, the way to be saved is just to turn and look at it. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It doesn't make any sense at all. That's like goofy. That's crazy. That's I was going to say Dr. Seuss, but not really, more like Lord of the Rings. Like, that's, that's crazy stuff. And yet, that's how it worked. I don't understand that, except that God said it by faith, I'll do it, and that's what happens. That's crazy. And Jesus is saying the same thing to Nicodemus. It's not about your works. It's not about how good you are. It is about putting your faith in the only one who can save you. The only one. And he goes on and he says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Who is baptism for? Every person who has a beating heart. And if you are at a place in life where you are able to say, yeah, I, I've messed up my life, I've destroyed my life, I've blown up my life, putting your faith in Christ is the way to have a new life, a new life. If you're the person where you've been trying to do the right things all your life, you got the good grades, you got the good education, you got the good job, you've raised good kids, you're trying to raise good kids, you got the right house, you got the right whatever it is, you're doing what your parents, what society has said that you're supposed to do, and yet at the same time, you're like, man, I just keep spinning my wheels, and it seems like I can't get ahead, and it seems like uh, just things aren't going the right way. Guess what? You need a new life, a new worldview a new perspective. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And baptism is that next step of obedience to say, Lord, I'm publicly confessing you before all people.